Perhaps one of the biggest dangers posed by the war in Ukraine is the risk of catastrophe at the largest nuclear plant in Europe. The Zaporizhia plant has been under Russian control since March in a war zone. We're going to take some time now to talk about the situation and the risks at length with Rafael Grossi, the head of the UN's nuclear watchdog, the IAEA. Rafael, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us here in Thank Paris. Thank you. Good to be with you. So Russian forces took control of Zaporizhia five months ago. You've said that the nuclear safety pillars have all been compromised over the past several months. What are you most worried about and how worried are you? Well, it's a number of things we are worried uh, about. First, like you, say, you, like you said in your introduction, is the fact that you have the biggest nuclear power plant in Europe where uh, there are occupation forces uh, from, from Russia, then the local or the Ukrainian operators uh, cohabiting there, working there, of course, leading to tension. But not only that, we have seen that there has been there has been shelling, there has been in the vicinity or uh, inside the plant. There was fire in the beginning, the beginning of the war. If you remember, on the third of March, fourth of March, there was an episode there. There has there has been um, intermittent um, a cut in the outside power supply to the plant. So it's really a, a number of things that coming together put uh, such a big um, facility uh, at, at risk. Everyone agrees that the IAEA needs to get on site to yeah. ensure safety. Ukraine says it's approved your personal visit there. The French President Emmanuel Macron, who you sat down with uh, this morning, says Russian President Vladimir Putin has agreed to let you in. You yourself issued a statement saying the IAEA will visit the plant within days if talks to gain access succeed. What's happening with that? Has there been confirmation? Well, well we are very, very, very close to that. And all, all, all what you've said is true. Um, the, the thing is that this operation is extremely complex. Um, to, for starters, getting there. Hmm. This, is, this is a war zone. This is in Ukraine. It's already difficult. I've been there twice already. I was in Chernobyl, where we were also working and stabilizing the site. I, I, was, I was in South Ukraine, which is another uh, different nuclear power plant. Getting there is, of course, extremely complex. So we have to have all the security, security in the sense of uh, physical security, not being shot at, um, aspects that need to be taken care of. This requires the conflicting, a certain zone where we are going to be passing through. There's on top of that, we have to um, determine exactly the terms of the of the mission, what we are going to be doing there with my experts when we get there. This is what is taking a little bit of time. What's important, and, and you said it as well, I think now there is um, general recognition that uh, we need to be there, we need to be there soon. Um, uh, Kyiv uh, accepts it, Moscow accepts it, we need to go. And we are going to be there hopefully very, very soon. Is very soon days or weeks? Days. Mm. So there's been an increase in shelling, as you were saying, around the plant. Ukraine and Russia both accusing each other of, of being behind this, perhaps preparing attacks on the plant. Many people, whether it's locals or outside observers, worry that a nuclear accident linked to all of this violence could be a reality. Do you think there is truly a risk? We in cannot that exclude it. And already saying this is too far. Mm -hmm. We cannot exclude it. We have seen that there have been um, attacks, uh, perhaps not directly aiming the, the, the reactors, which are, by the way, very robust in this, in this sense. But what can lead to, a, to an accident at a nuclear power plant is not perhaps the fact that you attacked or try to damage the reactor. If you have a situation where, for example, the um, uh, spent fuel ponds uh, would be compromised, where you have the, f the fuel that was used and already is burned and, and, and it's there uh, in storage, so to speak, but there is still nuclear material there that could be, uh, you know, that uh, could lead to radiation. Or if you have the external power um, feeding the plant and thus feeding the cooling system of the reactors interrupted, then you could be very, very soon in a, in, in, a, in a place where you don't want to be. So this is why we say we need to go there, we need to stabilize the situation, we need to ensure a presence of the IAEA soon. 
At the moment, how do you go about verifying the information? Again, Zaporizhia is managed, run by the Russians, but it's actually concretely managed day to day by the Ukrainians. Uh, who are you in contact with and how are these technicians surviving in what must be well, incredibly tense situation? Well, it's a very, it's a, it's a very situation? unique situation, mm. indeed. It has never happened before, like many other things around this war, by the way. But in, in, in this specific case, you, you have this um, uh, this overlapping, if you want, of, of uh, different staff, of different nationalities, nationalities at war. So this is is, is, is not simple. Um, and, and one of the things we, we want to determine is how the managerial lines are operating, how the safety standards, which are set by the IAEA and the national regulators all over the world, are being observed. So this is one very important part of what we need to be doing there when we come. Mm. Have you been in contact with any of these technicians, the Ukrainian technicians, the who time. might be working at gunpoint at times? All, all, all the time we're in contact with the, the national Ukrainian regulators, with the Ukrainian operators, and of course with Russia, because Russia is in control. I was yesterday in Istanbul, for example, uh, negotiating with the, the Russian uh, side on the conditions of the visit. So we, as IEA, we are the international community, so we have to talk to everybody. The U.S., the EU, and the U.N. are calling for the area around the Zaporizhia plant to be a demilitarized zone. Given what we've seen recently, more Russian strikes in the east, shelling around the zone, uh, is this possibility of a demilitarized zone a reality for you? Well, uh, this is a matter that pertains more to the political negotiations and discussions, bilateral or the United Nations Security Council, what we want to ensure is that there is no nuclear uh, accident. And this would be a very good start. Mm. What about these claims from Ukraine that Russia might be planning on disconnecting Zaporizhia from Ukraine's power grid and connecting it to the Russian power grid? What might that entail? What kind of risks might be there if that happens? Well, listen to this. Of course, without being there, we do not have uh, the ability to, to corroborate that, that that is true or not. There's a bit of speculation in this. So we, we try to, as, as a technical organization, as an inspectorate, we try to base our statements on what we see. Um, what I can say is that this operation would not be a simple one to conduct, uh, to disconnect a, a nuclear power plant from a from grid A, if mm -hmm. you want, and it's not a plug and play sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So there, there is there is infrastructure that that needs to be in place. So there are a number of things. Um, we we've heard this. We 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 listen to this with with concern. But it is also one of these things that we can only have a view on when we are there on site. Which, in your words, will be within days. Hopefully, within days, we need to be there. Yes. All right. I want to turn now to another big issue that you're working on, obviously the nuclear talks in Iran. Yeah. For the past 18 months, Iran and world powers have been negotiating again a return to that deal that, of course, the Trump administration pulled out of in 2018. How close are we to a breakthrough on that? Well, um, the political negotiation is not one where the IAEA takes part. The IAEA is the guarantor, is the inspector of whatever is agreed uh, around that, that political table. Of course, we are company, we are very close to that process. What we hear is that uh, the negotiators have reached a stage where uh, just a political decision is is, is separating them uh, from uh, from uh, the agreement. Uh, for us, it's very important to have the necessary access, which is commensurate with such a big uh, nuclear uh, power program as or nuclear program as uh, Iran has it. And for the moment, we, we do not have it. So we are also expecting um, a breakthrough um, as soon as possible. Now, your role, of course, as you're saying, is to investigate into the situation. The nuclear material, for example, found at undeclared sites in Iran. Has Iran given you sufficient answers to explain the presence of that nuclear material? Or how do you confirm the reality or if there are deviations on the ground? Well, uh, unfortunately not, but not yet. I am hopeful. You know, my obligation is to, I cannot afford to despair. I have to look always for a way forward. And uh, I've said to our Iranian uh, counterparts that we are open to re-engage with them to try to uh, go to the bottom uh, of these situations. Not because there is any political agenda against them, not at all. What we need is to clarify this. When, when the IAEA finds things and there is no 
clear explanation for them. It is obvious that we will continue putting the questions until we get the clarifications. And this should be in everybody's interest. How do you feel now? Are you, are you confident that the IAEA would be able or is able to detect any deviant nuclear activity from Iran if need be, and also to help react in time, in the time it needs to? If the IAEA is given the necessary degree of access, our inspectors have all the capabilities to have this timely detection of any uh, deviation. So I'm extremely confident what we want is this to be a collaborative um, effort. Transparency is, of course, always together's benefit. Of course, a collaborative effort uh, requires parts of many players in this particular agreement. Uh, just a word on Israel, which has been so far such a sticking point in this agreement. Do you think truthfully that there will be some kind of deal signed soon? This is a matter between Iran and the IAEA. Others may have opinions and may have interests in the region, but I have to concentrate on my work uh, in Iran. I am aware of what Israel and other countries are saying and the opinions that they have, and of course, we, we respect that. But I, um, as an independent um, international agency, I concentrate on my mission. I talk to Iran. I work with them. I hope they will cooperate with us soon. Rafael Grossi, thank you so much for taking the time to come to Paris to talk to us. Great pleasure. You are the executive director of the IAEA, the UN nuclear watchdog. Thanks to you for watching France 24. Stay with us.